And we're live. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Lewis. I'm your host of the Virtual Star Party for August 25th, 2013. With us, we have a large group of astronomers from across the United States. And starting from left to right, let's introduce everyone. I have with us tonight without a telescope, unfortunately, but he has an excuse. Uh, we have David <laughs> Dickinson. How are you doing, David? I, I live in Florida. That's my excuse. Oh, and you just got off a plane. I just I, got off the plane. I, I probably could have got it set up if the moon was out. I probably could have. It's, it's, it's Monday here, so. That's true. It is Monday there. <laughs> and uh, also, one of my close neighbors, I suppose, only 15 minutes away, we have Gary Canella. How are you doing, Gary? Fairly close. Hi. And we also have Mark. Mark, I haven't hung out with you in a while, Mark. How have you been? I'm doing good. How are you? Close to Glad to be living back. the dream. Living the dream every day. <laughs> and we also have with us Russell Bateman. Now, Russell does not have a microphone right now, but he does have the moon, so I think I'll let him pass if he doesn't have a microphone. And another close guy to me, uh, Thad Zabo. How you doing, Dr. Thad? All right, Scott. So, yes, aren't we close? But anyway. <laughs> we are pretty close. <laughs> we were closer last, or, yeah, last Two time. weeks ago. Two weeks, Two weeks ago. ago. But, uh, yeah, things going well here. I got the, uh, the scope bringing deep sky objects from deep in the light dome of the Los Angeles area. Yes, so we'll, cool. we'll see what happens. <laughs> very good. Well, I'm going to head on over to Russell's view of the moon real quick. And just to remind everyone that can go ahead and make comments on YouTube. You can also click on the event page on Google Plus and leave any comments. If you're doing some astrophotography of your own and like to share it with the world, please feel free to share them on to the Google Plus event. Um, we're also on Facebook and Twitter. So on Facebook, we are the Virtual Star Party, and on Twitter, we are the, or the, underscore VSP. So feel free to get in touch with us there, and we will be around every single week. Fraser's not here with us tonight, um, and he won't be with us next week either, but hopefully he will return in three because he's a busy person and goes and does all sorts of different things. So what are we looking at here besides the Terminator? The moon is waning gibbous right now. It's a, just a few days from last quarter. So it looks to me like he's probably manually tracking, too, because I see it. it slides out of view because you're seeing the Earth's rotation, actually, as it's kind of drifting. And then I don't know if he's got a Dobsonian or how he's doing it, but it looks like he's, he's uh, manually kind of nudging it every few seconds to get it back. Uh, yeah, it definitely looks like that, and I love how, you know... Especially That's cool, though, yeah. And, and, Russell, I know you're in the chat. If you can tell us what scope and camera you're using, that would be great, and if you are hand-guiding, so we can share that with everyone. Yeah, hand-guiding hand takes uh, takes all your concentration, basically. So, yes. I don't, uh, with my webcam, the field of view is so small, you don't... The moon's a pretty bright target, but you don't want to... Once you acquire something, you don't want to lose it. Right, absolutely. Otherwise, it's... it's uh, you, know, you don't... You you don't, don't you don't realize how fast the Earth rotates till you look at something like that, and that's what you're seeing right there is actually our movement, mostly under the moon. Right. That's the, the moon drifts out of. Looks like he's got the lunar highlands in there right now. Now, do you have a lunar kilt to wear on the lunar? <laughs> I think we should. Some moon I, pipes. I think that's either Tico or I don't have my maps in front of me, so or my my lunar my Universe Today lunar uh, app, so. App. I think that's either Tycho or Copernicus right down there that I see centered in the field. So. But. Very see. good. Do you, know, do you know what we're looking at, Thad? Um, yeah, hang on. I, I'm going to say it's one of those two. I think it's Copernicus, but with, without the map in front of me, I'm not quite certain. I can see kind of a big splash of craters there. I don't want to pull any other windows open on my computer or I'll like leave the hangout. So. <laughs> Let's see. So right now, yeah, that's uh, that's Tico. Okay. Tico? Yeah. Yep. I know it's one of the newer, fresher looking craters where you, right. can, little, you, you can see the rays and the, it's it's a relatively new crater. New being probably still thousands of years old. Right. So. You know, not not new to us, but it's yeah. definitely new yeah. to the moon. Yeah. Or, or tens of millions of years old, actually, yeah, ten, more, more ten, likely. Yeah. But now we've swung around to like Copernicus and Kepler in the view here, and the uh, the Apennines kind of jutting off to the the right side of the picture there. Yeah. So. Very good. Well, I'm gonna head on over nice. to Gary real quick because we will visit the moon here throughout okay. the show. What are we looking at, Gary? This is M31, the Andromeda. This is a uh, two-minute 
uh, bend 4x4 four four to get enough light to get the lighter areas. But it's finally starting to come up. It's pretty low on the horizon right now, but it's coming up for the season, and I know a lot of people ask about uh, about old Andromeda. Old Andromeda, our, yeah. our galactic neighbor. Here she is with the, with the dark Eli. lanes and its yes. companion galaxies yeah. here and here. Yeah, you can see the satellite galaxies. And you got you got a lot of the extension and the, the fainter, wispy areas out there, too. That's kind of cool. And it's heading right for us. It's heading right for yep. us. It would be milk, milk dromeda, or what, what are they they're calling the, the merger? <laughs> I, I think it's milk drama or the Andro way. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I like Andro way. Like yeah. Milk dromeda. I'm not going to be around. Well, I hope to be around. Like, was it yeah, that's, five billion years? Yeah, that's. Uh, the, we'll probably be. A, there probably won't be life here by then anyway. So right, because <laughs> our star being what it is. Yeah. But I plan on being on our space station somewhere between here and there. I totally yeah. plan on being yeah. around we, for five. If we manage years. to move off, and yeah, it's. Uh, and, and and our sun is is gradually increasing its uh its its out solar output too. So I think they said that surface water on Earth's got maybe about a billion years. So, oh, lovely. Yeah. So yeah. drink up, drink up, everyone. The the urgency to learn how to get off of this planet and live well off of this planet is you know, even even if humans can get global warming under control, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, even if you know. Um, we don't have to deal with other climate change, factor, change factors. The fact is the sun is getting larger and hotter little by little and a billion years, that's that's the ultimate fuse. At that point, forget it. The, there's no more water left on Earth's surface. We better know how to live somewhere else. I think the output, if I recall, is, is 1%. Uh, the, the sun is increasing by 1% output a hun every 100 million years, I think is roughly in there just off the top of my head. So that's like a 10% increase in a billion years. Oh, is that it? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's not like it's fusing hydrogen and helium <laughs> at super, super hot. I'm going to okay. head on over to Mark real quick. What are we looking at, Mark? Uh, this is M11 or the Wild Duck Cluster. So this is a pretty dense open cluster. This is a good binocular target too. I, I I hunt this one down sometimes. It's in. Do you, do you hunt the wild duck, yeah, David? You actually, hunt I do. The wild duck. I like that. Very nice. So where are we looking at this at? Which uh, constellation? It's, it, it's in Aquila. It's kind of at the bottom, the southern end of Aquila. Aquila, the eagle. If you think of the summer triangle, right? Where you've got uh, Altair is a bright star, and Aquila is the most southernmost vertex of the southern triangle. It's in that same constellation. And we're looking at... All right, you got to count the stars. Come on. How many are in this cluster? <laughs> and I know I did mute you because of the, the, the cars going by. So Sorry, just... I'm in the... Uh, I'm outside today, so... How dare there, you? There, there's some noise. Uh, well, but uh, according to my, in Chicago, my scope... Right? There, yeah, I'm just outside of Chicago. Uh, it, I, if uh, we're lucky or unlucky, a plane might fly through the field of view. You're saying that. I saw that in the chat. That would be cool. That happens here in Tampa sometimes when the moon is at the right phase. I've actually set out with the DSLR and tried to catch aircraft transits. Actually, Rus Russell said that, and with his magnification on the moon and the live view, he's got a way better chance of getting the plane than I do, because uh, yeah. this is, I think, a 30-second exposure, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would have to go through right as it's exposing, too. So. Yeah. So what, uh, what telescope and camera are you using, Mark? Uh, this is my Celestron C8 uh, with a Canon T3i digital SLR on the back. Nice. Uh, Non-modified. You know, everything's pretty stock. You're not a hacker? Uh, not yet. I started building my own dew heater, but that's uh, oh. my, my soldering skills leave a lot to be desired still. <laughs> How long is that exposure on M11 right there? Uh, I think it's about 30 seconds. Okay. Very good. All right, I'm going to head on over to Thad and see this beautiful color image that he's bringing in. What are we looking at, Thad? So this is, this is uh, M13. This is the great globular cluster in Hercules. And uh, 
So I'm shooting with a Hyperstar, so it's a very short focal length, very fast optical system. And there's a light pollution filter in there, so if things look a little bit bluish, that's what's uh, what's going on and causing that. But I noticed, you know, I don't know if you can see where I'm kind of pointing up here with the... Um, yeah, the yeah. cursor. Yeah, yeah, that there's the galaxy that nice. appears in the same field of view from Long um, Beach, and uh, yeah, from from Long Beach, California, where you know, it's like, okay, this is about half a million people, but in the general vicinity, there's about you know, ten million people, with all their freaking lights turned on. So, well, it's like that there's even a chance of getting a galaxy here. So it is kind of cool to show, though it's not optimal, but you can get deep sky views from suburban urban areas still. It is yeah. possible. Yep. The other thing that helps, though, is that this is near the zenith. So one thing, I yeah. do want to try seeing if I can get the lagoon now so we can have that in color. But um, we'll see how that goes because then I'll be looking right over the port of Long Beach. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Very cool. Now, Mike, and I'm going to head back over to Russell again to get a view of the moon. You can see and the app. Atmospheric turbulence right there too, as it's shimmering there. It, it is shimmering, and so yeah, you know, what we're looking at, we're looking at the photons going through a medium. You know, after mm -hmm. it reaches through space, it comes through our atmosphere. So it's playing around with the the molecules in the air, and things are going to be moving around. It's going to be bending around it, yeah. and so we get it. This is how we know it's live. Besides that, Russell's moving it, and we're also <laughs> showing that. Uh, and he's using a, a Celestron 114EQ manual tracking with an Orion solar system. Uh, cool. And so, yeah, that's that's doing great there, manual tracking. I've, I've only done that once for the VSP. That's It's terrible. difficult. It is yeah. difficult. <laughs> Luckily, it was, you know, it was for the, the eclipse, yeah. so that wasn't too bad, but it was still a pain. I like how some of the craters you can see where the sun is just rising along the Terminator. Like there's one in the very upper right, my upper right anyway, it might be inverted. But you can see the central peak and you can see the rim where it's just starting to catch the sun. So the, the sun is yeah. coming up. But of course the sun will be above the horizon on if you were standing there on that crater for about two weeks. Two it's of our weeks long, anyway. Romantic sunrise. Yeah, until you see the sun set again. So. And if you were looking at the Earth from the Earth would be the reverse phase up in the sky. The Earth, the Moon is is waning gibbous right now, but the Earth would be a crescent if you were looking at it. So it'd be quite a view. It's quite a view. And yeah, I'm I'm loving yeah on the the Terminator there where you're able to see the the edges of the crater kind of pop up. That's the always view. the coolest thing to see. Yeah, I see a few little peaks and edges that are just starting to catch. Actually, the sun is setting there now because the moon is waning. Waning, so right. I'm, I'm always used to watching it when it's waxing because you see that in the evening more. So it's actually reversed now. So the sun is setting there right now. No, I'm loving it. And let's see. What do you have, Mark? I see pixels. What are we looking at, Mark? Uh, so this is a double star zoomed in pretty far. Uh, Resolgedi. It's a... You know, I, I had to do a really short exposure mm -hmm. and zoom in really far to be able to, to split it, but you can just kind of see, uh, oh, cool. that, it, yeah, you can see that it's split. two different stars. Yeah, that's in Hercules, too. That name sounds familiar. Uh, M13, we were just looking at that that had. That's in Hercules as well. Yeah, Russell Getty is the uh, the brightest star in uh, in Hercules. Although you know, there's no really bright star in Hercules. You hear brightest star, it's like, oh, can I just go out and look at this? You know, <laughs> not from my skies. I mean, I, I can look up in this direction. I don't see Russell Getty. I get Russell Haig, which is yeah. the brightest star in Ophiuchus, which is pretty much right next door. But it's significantly brighter than Russell Getty. So, yeah, get one, not the other, from here. So, <laughs> very nice and. So if you excuse me a moment, I have to go make sure that the Lagoon Nebula is not in a tree. I'm getting part of it. <laughs> what have I told you about putting nebulae in trees? <laughs> you know, I'm just getting ready for Christmas, right? Some people will do little angels and Santas and whatever. I put a nebula in the tree. Right? <laughs> and Newton on top, because it Newton is on top? birthday. Yes. So, all right, okay. be right back. Yeah. All right, and Gary, you're sharing your entire desktop right I now. know. Okay. I, I Screen share is not working. Uh-oh. I can't I, switch... I'm going to disconnect and reconnect. Yeah, or uh, you might be able just to refresh your, your Hangout window. That might be able to help. You'll drop out and drop right back in. So all this going, I'm going to go through the comments and take a look at what we're going on. Uh, yes, Brian, we are Fraserless tonight and for next <laughs> week, but he will be back. 
have no fear. Our Canadian uh, cohort will will return soon. And let's see here. Think someone's being arrested? Yeah, it was probably Mark. Run, Mark. <laughs> Run. Is that Albario? I think so. That Mark. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, it looks, yeah, like it looks familiar. Yeah. Albario. Albario. It's in Cygnus the Swan. So Cygnus. That's a, and that's I love another. the color differential. That we're able yeah, to see this is this is a good one to show people at star parties because it has uh, a color contrast to it. There's a few other doubles I know that have a good color contrast, but this is one of the brightest ones. There's also one that's kind of nicknamed the Winter Alberio that's similar in Canis Major that I like to show people in the wintertime because you don't always have Alberio to show people. Summertime is a good time because it's right overhead. Right, absolutely. This, this one you can split with binoculars too. It's a very easy split. So it's, uh, it's one of the more common double stars. And I like double stars, too, because in urban and suburban areas, if I'm doing a star party like in downtown St. Pete, I can show, and there's no planets or moons, double stars are about what we have to look at. Because right, things right. like M31 won't show up from downtown St. Pete. Well, that's a great thing, too, is to show people that you don't need to have some enormous expensive telescope, that you can have binoculars. Yeah. And that's a great way of not only getting to see the night sky, but also getting to know and understand the night sky and where things and I, are. I, I have uh, a pair of binoculars that probably are about the cost of a telescope. I have a pair of image stabilized binoculars that I use probably 90% of the time because mm -hmm. they're, they're easy to just pop out and look at something. You don't have to go through the setup and the aligning and if you're just doing right. visual observing, I really, and I carry them hiking, I've carried them down to the southern hemisphere where I, I couldn't really pack a telescope and bring it with me, so binoculars are cool. They are cool. Well, I'm Gary's back, and I'm your computer back. is working. Oh, very nice. What are we looking at? This is uh, M16, the Eagle Nebula, and I did this with no bidding, so we can zoom in. Zoom and enhance. You see the yeah, colors of creation. The areas. I also made sure that I um, didn't highlight the bright areas too much, so we could actually see the dark detail yeah. here in the uh, pillars of creation. But there's all kinds of nice little dark knots in here. It's uh, pretty that's amazing. On, that's on your Google Plus icon too, isn't it? It's the same image. Um, it's color. No, right? no. Oh, okay. The the icon is from uh, the Eta Carina Nebula. Carina oh, okay. Nebula. We can't see it here, but I ran across it and loved it. I just decided that's what the universe thinks of us. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, with the got it. Yep. So what we look? Oh, that's gone. So you know, here with the pillars of creation, we're seeing this great star forming region, which most likely isn't even around anymore, because it just with the tumultuous environment and so much energy going on there, with the the birth of really hot, really massive stars and them exploding out, most likely what we're looking at is not going to be there anymore, I which I think is awesome. I think the distance range on this is a few thousand light. I know it's further than the Orion Nebula, which is about a thousand. Right. A, a few, I think this is at the range of a few thousand light years. Again, just without any kind of info in front of me. To, but it's, uh, yeah, our, our sun may have, well, our sun was formed in something like that, not that particular one, but uh, we don't really know where our sun was formed. It's, it's all our siblings have been dispersed around the galactic disk. So. Right. No, I, I love the detail you're able to get in here today, Gary. That looks great. Yeah, that one came out real nice tonight. I thought I was going to have a, a hazy night, but it uh, the scene came out pretty good. Yeah, last night was pretty bad out here in L.A. It just yeah. got nasty all of a sudden, out of nowhere. So I'm glad it that looked like little... it was looked like it's going to be that way tonight too. Northern Hemisphere summer is just bad all over. Yeah, for for viewing, there's just a lot of convection, a lot of thunderstorms, things like that. Yeah. But this is one you could just kind of stare at forever. Yeah, yeah. And, and we that, have a re uh, request on YouTube. I'm not sure of this. What the Kit Kat King is asking is: the Sunflower Galaxy available for viewing? I don't know. Um, and I'll remind. I can try. Since we may have new people here, this is a one-minute exposure from my backyard in the Los Angeles area. Right. Cool. Uh, with a, a filter for just the light of hydrogen alpha which is normally a red light that I filter everything out so I can get this detail. That's something I think we forget is we get new people in, and since we're looking at the same stuff every week, we forget to go over that stuff. Well, can yeah. you show us your, your scope? I know you've got a, a live cam out there. 
I can. I didn't. I need to bring it up. I'll do that in just one minute here. Awesome. So if you do that, I'm going to head over to Mark real quick, and we'll take a look at what Mark's got going, and then we can uh, take a peek at Gary's telescope. So I think this is the Nova in Delphus. Oh, cool. Yeah, we were looking at that last week, too. more or less uh, in the center of, this, of the picture there. I, I think you're right, because I've been looking at it the field for a, a, a few nights off and on. It's still pretty... I haven't seen the brightness lately. I think it's still fifth magnitude. Which I think is awesome. This, this was originally found by a Japanese amateur astronomer, which yeah, I think is it just, phenomenal. It just flared up. Um, it was right... It was uh, last... The week before last, or last week, right at right during the parasites, because a bunch of us started going through our images. We were shooting parasite images, and we heard about this, mm -hmm. this Nova and Delphinus, to see if anybody had caught it while it was just rising up to brightness. There, there's been some uh, some rough distance estimates I've seen going around on some of the astronomical telegrams of, of about, I believe, 4,000 parsecs. So it's it's out there quite a ways. Yeah, it is quite a ways out That's there. That's further than I thought. That's I I, I kind of did a rough guesstimate. Based on other historical nova, I thought maybe it's about 1,500 light years, so it's much further than that. Mm -hmm. Now, Thad, can you explain to our awesome viewers what the difference between a nova and a supernova is? Because a lot of times they do get thrown about, but they are quite different from what's going on. Sure. I mean, what's really kind of uh, st strange, I guess, is I, I can't quite remember which term would have come first, but most likely supernova. Um, because supernovae would have been visible to the, the naked eye. Um, nova means new in, um, in Latin, and so it appears to be a new star. I mean, it looks new to us. The truth is, it's very old. It's a white dwarf, typically, that's eaten a whole bunch of material from a nearby star, and as that stuff compacts on the outer layers of the star, it can get hot enough to undergo fusion very quickly. And so what's going on with uh, Nova Delphinus here is that that's exactly what it was. It's a white dwarf. It's had a whole bunch of extra material from a nearby star pack onto it and when enough uh, gets packed on there and it can, can fusion can initiate it brightens dramatically very uh, quickly over about a day uh, maybe a day or a few or a few days and um, and then we'll we'll shine brighter like that for a couple of, of weeks as that light diffuses out through it supernova is the the death of a either a massive star or it's a white dwarf exploding entirely so I mean here the white dwarf that formed that we're looking at with Nova Delphinus, it's probably still out there. And that white dwarf can then, after it's blown off this outer shell, it can continue to accumulate things again, and maybe it will go off again in 1,000 years, 10,000 years. We don't know. Supernova, you get one shot. This, right. Either the white dwarf blows up, either you have a white dwarf that blows up entirely, or you have a massive star like Antares or Betelgeuse that reaches the end of its life and blows up entirely. So... And what I love, too, that it's typically, you know, you're going to have a binary system when you're having a nova. And so it's going to be pulling off mass uh, matter from a larger star, and that's where it that fuses on top of the, the outer realm of that white dwarf, and that which actually causes it to blow out, which I thought was really cool the first time I got into it, is that, wow, it's, we're, we're watching what's going on as it's pulling off and, and trying to steal matter from another star and it's actually yes. exploding outwards. I, I thought that was really, really cool. It is thieving material, yes. You, you do have it in there, Mark. I was looking at the uh, the finder charts on Universe Today that Bob King had done, and that looks to be, it's uh, 27 Volpeculae off to the side, because it's right on the border with Delphinus and Volpeculae, so... Yeah. Okay, so that one, that bright, the bright one in the middle... The bright one in the center looks like it, the, the star fields match up on the article, so... Okay, yeah. nice, because I, I just got the coordinates and typed it in, and I'm like, that looks about like the center, so I bet that's it. How yeah, wide is your field of view, roughly? Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure. I've got, uh, it's a uh, 8 inch scope with the, the fo F6.3 uh, focal reducer in there. Okay. So I don't know what that maps out to, to get the field of view. I know it's a little bit more than a full moon. So probably a little over half a degree. 
That's that's awesome. Thank you, Mark, for bringing that in. So yeah, being able to show this amazing uh, this ama- amazing event in, in in astronomy and astrophysics, this, and being able to see what's going on there, and actually get to see it live here on the show, it's really cool. This, this Nova, the the American Association of Variable Star Observers, was saying that this is already the top thirty historical Nova uh, that's that have been observed in apparent brightness. It it, it uh, it's in the the top thirty, so that's kind of cool. That is really cool. Yeah. This is in our galaxy as opposed to a supernova that you would see. We haven't had a bright supernova until I think uh, Kepler's was the last one in the early 1600s. Yeah, six, had, so. 1603, yeah. six years before Galileo first turned a telescope on the night sky. So, yeah. you know, unless you count 1987A for the southern hemisphere, there hasn't been a naked eye supernova since the uh, the invention of the telescope. Yeah, so we're due. So get on it, <laughs> massive stars. We, it's not too we close, but there, there's nothing yeah, really... It's not too close. There's yeah. nothing... There's only Betelgeuse and Spica are the closest, I believe, and they're out of the kill zone, so... Yes. So let them blow. <laughs> they put on a good show. Orion would look very different with the supernova on its shoulder, so... Yes, it would. Oh, yeah. So here's Gary's scope. Can yeah, you make a dance for us, Gary? Come on, make a dance. Say, say that again? Make it dance. I will. This All is the right. main part of the scope. Up here is the guide scope. So when I'm taking long exposures, I lock this onto a star, and it makes a, causes the scope to follow. And I can do this and bring it down here. Oh, cool. It's alive. And you can see where my... Uh, cups to press the right buttons. <laughs> Like you can observe through the ground? That's awesome. Yes, I can. <laughs> and this is where the camera's mounted. Oh, very good. Right on the front inside oh, the windshield. It's like the hyperstar kind of setup. It's, it is a hyperstar, yeah. Yeah. And there you can see the main mirror. I think if I do this, it'll probably reflect everything right back at the camera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and would that mean that you're the star? Oh, it would. Yeah. It would. So I'm shooting, it's 14-inch scope, and I'm shooting at f1.9. So uh, when I look at the sky, I'm looking at a degree by a degree and a half, so 60 by 90 arc minutes. Which is insane, Gary. So now I'm going to point it back over to M8. Very good. We'll so while you're doing that, here. I'm going to pull up Thad real quick. It's gorgeous. What are we looking at, Thad? This is M17. Sometimes called the Swan Nebula, sometimes called the Lobster Nebula, sometimes called the Horseshoe Nebula, sometimes called the Omega Nebula. Any one, of, any of those, it's a large cloud of uh, hydrogen gas that's being beat upon by ultraviolet rays and caused to fluoresce. And so with that hydrogen having electrons falling from higher energy levels down to lower energy levels, we get this reddish color. This is characteristic of hydrogen emission. So really, this is the same kind of light that Gary is looking at, um, except I've got a color camera and a light pollution filter, because where I'm looking at this in the sky right now, this is right over the port of Long Beach. <laughs> but uh, that, that light pollution filter seems to be doing a terrific job for yeah, you. Doing a great job. That's an amazing job for you, are. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, this is the same thing I've got here. And I, just I, the hydrogen see, light. All right, I see your telescope right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Helps if I change the screen. I mean, you're just being a tease. Like, yeah, that's what I'm looking at, but I'm not going to share it with you. You can't see it. (laughs) I am looking at it, but you're not. Ha ha. Oh, wow. Yep. That's more gooder. More gooder. (laughs) More gooder. Mm -hmm. And I'm rotated about 90 degrees from Thad's. Yes, I've been using your your handy VSP thing here and kind of zoomed in a little bit and flipped at 90 degrees. So I, I'm in awe at what you came with in, in Long Beach. That's great. I can't believe this. This is my first time trying this this uh, L, this light pollution filter out with the Hyperstar. So um, my wife will definitely be happy that I don't have to drive out into the mountains to get shots like this anymore. I'm I'm kind of flabbergasted, flabbergasted actually. So. Yeah, that's spectacular. Well, you don't have to, but we can still go on trips and and go look at you know, some some clearer skies out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We can take the VSP on the road. Who there wants to go. fund us? We'll take the VSP on the road. I've actually gotten the 3G signal from Mount Pinos. Really? 
yeah, it's, it's you know you're at 8,300 feet above sea level, but because there are towers up there, yeah, I've I've had a 3G signal up there. Nice. So. And as Gary's moving around, and th there we go. So it's matching up to what what Dad's yeah. saying as far as it's still. So that's what, that's phenomenal. What you're seeing in Thad is the real color uh, minus the anything that the filter's putting in. In mine, you're seeing it black and white, but it's just the light given off by the hydrogen. So even though I'm in pretty much the same light polluted area that Thad is, I can pick up these uh, un these little uh, delicate tendrils and pieces going on. That's cool to have the contrast between the two. Yeah. Very good. I'm, I'm loving that. So if you guys can net, put that up onto the the event page after we're done, that'd be great. Some that will. Changes. May not put it up there till the morning, but that'll go up. Awesome. So I'm going to hop over to Russell real quick, take a look at the moon some more. Are you having fun out there, Russell? Let me check the chat and see if you're... <laughs> I was looking to see if... Uh, I was thinking that the Lunar X might be a, a favorable illumination. It's, it's, it's not quite at the no. Terminator yet. So it's, you also get it when, it goes, when the moon goes to waning right, right around first and last quarter, too. So uh, it's... Uh, and, and Russell does point out that he is the only Canadian tonight, and that is true. So, I, although I like to say I'm an honorary Canadian because I was born about 20 kilometers away, and I spent a lot of my childhood there. So, uh, about 20 kilometers a, away. A, a boot, you know, I'm about 20 kilometers away, eh? and I, I love hockey, so that, I'm, I like to be on the border. I, I do miss not needing my passport to go to Canada. That's kind of crazy. But I checked with them; they don't claim you. No, they probably wouldn't. <laughs> I don't blame them for that at all. <laughs> Very good. Well, keep that going there, Russell. I'm going to hop over to Mark. And what do we have here, Mark? This is another double star. This is uh, Ada Cass, I think is how it's pronounced. I'm not sure. Uh, I tried to get the Sunflower Galaxy, but there was a house in the way, so... Sorry, I couldn't fill that request. <laughs> yeah, sunflower is really low to the horizon, right about, right about. I mean, it's pretty, pretty low in the west. So, I mean, the thing is, right now, all those galaxies located in like Virgo and Bootes and Corona Borealis, Ursa Major, and at, at this time of year, those constellations are starting to slip away um, into the west. So, you know, but then yeah. again, in the east, now we're getting things like Andromeda and you know Pegasus and Perseus. And other galaxy-rich areas of the sky uh, starting to come up in the east. We're, we're we're getting into a span of time that's planetless right now too. Yeah. We're yeah. All the there's Mars and Mars and Jupiter are in, are in the morning sky at dawn, and Venus and Saturn are are in the evening sky. Although Neptune reaches opposition, I just wrote an article about that for the Universe Today. As a matter of fact, Neptune reaches opposition this week. Uh, we might be able to get that in. It will look like just a dot. It won't look like anything, but. Neptune may be possible. Yep. In Uranus, it's, Neptune's in Aquarius, and Uranus, I think, is in Capricornus right now, I think. U Uranus is in Pisces. Pisces. Yeah, it's so, right next door. Yeah, if you draw a line from Sheet, which is one corner of the uh, the Great Square of Pegasus, through Algenib, which is the opposite corner from Sheet, you follow that line straight down, it pretty much points you right at Uranus. That's right. So, yeah, it's, it's, I, know, I know Neptune is in Aquarius right now, but... And there, there was an amateur did a actually did an animation of Triton. I think he had a 14 inch scope. He actually managed to image Triton near Neptune and did a small animation of it, uh, like three or four frames of it in motion. So I thought that's kind of cool. That is really cool. It, it is in range. Triton's about as bright as Pluto, so it is in range of a of an amateur scope, a large amateur scope, in dark skies, in no moon. No moon. <laughs> right. That that does help. I don't know if we'd be able to get it tonight. It might might be washed out. The moon's the moon's not too far away. So, yeah, sorry, Kit Cat King. We won't be able to get to the Sunflower Galaxy, but maybe you can give us a break, and um, we'll try to find it some other time of the year. Bad joke. Boom. And let's see here. Gary, what do you have for us, Gary? This is uh, M8 Lagoon Nebula. Wow. And this is one of my favorites because it's got all kinds of little fiddly bits in here. Fiddly bits. No, that yeah. is an actual astronomical term, everyone. <laughs> it is. Yes. All these neat little fiddly bits. With some, some cosmic flotsam and jetsam that's uh -huh. out there as well. Slardy Bartfast did this <laughs> Oh, that's an actual astronomical term, yeah. <laughs> 
So, Thad, what, tell us what's going on with the Lagoon. So again, another one of these hydrogen star formation uh, regions, that, that knot of gas, the kind of brightest area there. Somewhere in there is an O-class star, and actually I just slewed over to the lagoon also so I can bring it in color here. Um, you know, somewhere in there there's um, an O-class star, so when you, you rank stars by their spectral type, O's are the hottest, and it's O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Um, O's are the, these real monstrous sized stars. They put out an enormous amount of, of high energy radiation and you know really gets the electrons jumping up on um, any nearby hydrogen. And as the electrons come back down to lower levels, boom, here's this glow that we call hydrogen alpha. And I can't tell if I'm still in a tree with this nebula or not. Um, let me get right back to you on that. I can see if I can, I have some, I have it, but it looks like I might be still getting a occultation by a tree. Hang on a second. <laughs> a terrestrial occultation. Yeah, yeah. What have I told you about being in trees, too? You're always putting stuff in trees, Dad. Now, how long of a shot was that, Gary? That was uh, one minute at uh, no binning at all. So just a full the 60 second exposure. Wow. That, just what you're able to do with, with your scope and, and your camera is just phenomenal. It still blows me away every time. Yeah, and, and the only disadvantage that I can find of the way it is is the focus is very sensitive and it changes radically with temperature. Right. And it's not like we don't have crazy temperature changes out here. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. No, nope, ever. It was, what, it was 39 yesterday. It's insanely hot. And I, I'm talking Celsius for, yeah, you, gotta be good you know, the rest Celsius. of the world. <laughs> you know, the rest of the world knows what I'm talking about, but it's hot. It was like 101 out here in Fahrenheit. It was, I'm not happy with that. That needs to stop. <laughs> it's not fun. No. But it's a dry heat, so... I was going to say, you don't have the humidity like we do here. <laughs> That's one thing I don't miss about Michigan. I do not miss the humidity. Of that. Or all, Florida. That's all of the East Coast. It's yeah. just humid and... So I'm going to hop over to Mark real quick. What are we looking at, Mark? I was going to say, what is that? M34 is another okay. open cluster. That's in Auriga, I think? Yes. Yeah, well, the 30s, 34, 35, 36 are in Auriga. So what's the difference between an open cluster and a globular cluster? Anyone want to help me out with that? <laughs> so open it's, cluster... Besides like, the spelling. <laughs> When we're looking at something like um, M8 or actually M16, I've got the Eagle in here now. I'll bring it up in a, in a moment as soon as I get a long enough exposure. Um, you, you have gas and dust that's forming stars recently, and they form close enough to each other that you kind of have a loose, uh, you know, associations loosely held together by gravity. Uh, of course, the interactions between the, uh, the stars themselves or between other nearby stars can fling these things apart. So if you're looking at an open cluster, you're looking at newer stars and typically fewer. I mean, a, a huge open cluster might have a few thousand stars. You know, typically you're looking more in the, the range of a few hundred. Globular or globular clusters um, are left over from when the galaxy formed. And instead of looking at just a few thousand st stars, you're looking at tens of thousands to more than a million stars. The other thing is the type of stars. They're not new. They're not young. These stars are about 13 billion years old if they're in a globular cluster. Right. So um, The metallicity yeah. is low. Metallicity is low, meaning they're almost entirely hydrogen and helium. It, when the, you know, shortly after the Big Bang, that's it. There was hydrogen, and helium, and a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of lithium. And it needed to deal with the stress. There, yeah, there hydrogen. we go. So, although it'll be you know, sure. hell on their kidneys, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, so. They're like the they're like the winger of the stellar classification. They're not very metal. <laughs> no, <laughs> there we go. No, they're they're. <laughs> They're very much the, the old people on the outside of the galaxy. Going, Damn you kids and your heavy metal. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, so you know these these stars, these groups of stars that would have formed at about the same time the galaxy formed, and um, they're still held together. There's also some talk that they might be dwarf galaxies that kind of got ripped up by the the um, interaction with the Milky Way, and so the core is still there, um, but the uh, yeah, the rest of the galaxy is the gas and whatever else that would have formed with it has kind of been stripped out, and you're left with this essentially ball of stars. So, I love it. And you know, we—I'm not sure if I like 
the the open clusters or the the globular clusters more. I like the globular clusters more myself because I like the the just the the fact of the the low metallicity and understanding how they are in in, in the evolution of our universe. But also, open clusters have some really neat designs in them, and just seeing how they they're all put in together in the sky. M M35 is one of my faves to show people at star parties when it's up. That's a good open cluster in Gemini. And, and to throw something in here as someone who is not trained in astronomy, and I found very strange, is they always refer to low metallicity. Well, we look at metals as iron and aluminum and all the heavy stuff. Uh, right. Astronomers, if it's not helium or hydrogen, it's metal. <laughs> yep. They just draw the line right we, there. We have a very low standard for how <laughs> yeah. how hardcore something the, needs to be for it to be metal. The universe is <laughs> hydrogen and helium and everything else. Everything yeah. else. <laughs> so that was one that took me a little while to get my head wrapped around. No, it, it's something that when I first was studying it too, I'm like, what you, that's not a metal. What are you talking about? But anything because there is the large component being hydrogen and helium. Yeah, because in, in in chemistry and is on the periodic table, there are the the metals mean very different things. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. So, go through the comments real quick here. Um, let's see here. Frostbite on YouTube says, "Can we get a VSP version of tomorrow's APOD, which is NGC seven zero two seven, which I believe is in Cygnus." So let's see. I it's up. It's a planetary nebula. NGC seven. Hmm. That would be awesome if, if we could pull that up here today. Um, Eric seven. says on YouTube, yes, I am a huge Red Wings fan. I I, I definitely am. Go Wings. And yeah, hockey time. Oop. It is very near to where I am right now, but I don't think it's going to show up in my field of view. Yeah, your enormous field of view. Yeah, it's a pretty small object. Right. That are you able to? I'll uh, give it a shot, small. but there might be a house in the way. No, with the hyperstar, I mean, my field of view is about 50 minutes by 30 arc minutes. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think but, Mark should try it. Go, Mark. But I'll have M16 here in color in just a moment. Awesome. So I'm going to head over to Gary. Wow. Okay. This is the um, Pelican Nebula. In fact, if I do this to it, it looks more like a pelican with the beak down this way in the head. Oh, wow. Or if I rotate it one more time, it's a rabbit with the nose <laughs> here, and this is the ears and the eye. Yay, Peridolia. But this is uh, this is one of my favorite ones too. It's got all kinds of neat little things. The uh, this is part of the North American Nebula complex. Uh, okay, up insane. above the top of this picture would be the east coast of North America. So I can move over to some of that here in a little bit. But uh, this is the pelican, and uh, yeah, I like it. One of my favorites. It is really nice. Yeah, I'm liking the. You know the designs you're seeing there, and, and the dark bands where, like, right behind the the bunny ear, mm -hmm. you're looking at. And you know, I have been bugging you for months now, Gary. Any progress on your on your map of North America? Uh, on my what? You were breaking up. What'd you say? Any uh, progress on huh? your map of North America? What? Oh, what? I, I'm mm. sorry, you're breaking up. <laughs> mm. Mm. Funny how that works. Here, I'll, I'll just drive over to your house and ask you in person. Okay, do that. I've been really <laughs> bad at doing photography. There's astrophotography these days. That's okay. I'll, I'll just bug you some more. And okay. Be relentless. You're welcome to. And then I'll complain that's not in color. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, Thad. Let me hop over here real quick. Yep, M16, the color version. Wow. Yes. So, cool. I mean, yeah, Gary had this up earlier. Um, again, the hydrogen alpha filter, mainly selecting that reddish color that you're seeing in the, the shot I have here. Again, levels are, are kind of stretched here, so I mean, it was really you're kind of trying to suppress the um, the background light a little bit. Even with the light pollution filter, it's you know, still coming through with, uh, you know, injecting some stuff there that really don't want. But, um, but um, yeah, this stop is... Stop injecting. That is that. amazing. That, that is, is amazing for where yeah. you are. Yeah, I'm... Uh, yeah, I'm pretty psyched about this. So, so yeah, yeah, we've got pillars of creation in the middle there. I mean, I tried these before at some point without a light pollution filter and got pillars of crap. Um, <laughs> but now, yeah, now I, th I think we're really starting to see a little bit more of that, um, 
that kind of sculpted region that, like you said, there's evidence that there's a shock wave that's coming from a slightly more distant region of this nebula from a supernova that would have happened earlier. And at this point, because the nebula itself is a good six or 7,000 light years away, that shock wave is much closer to where these pillars are. The pillars probably don't likely do not exist anymore that the shockwave from that supernova has just blasted them out of existence. So, you know, here you're, you're seeing something that has since been destroyed, most likely. Which, so. is, yeah, it's just phenomenal to think about that, you know, this, the speed of light is you know, limited, so we have to watch things unfold slowly as things have, have come to evolve over time and that there's, you know, space is very dynamic in what's going on. There's so many things that are playing with one another. And, you know, being able to find that evidence of going out there that something has happened in the past. We're waiting to see what is going to happen. I think that's wonderful. That's my favorite part of, of astronomy I, and astrophysics is taking I, that evidence and watching it unfold. I looked it up. It's uh, approximately 7,000 light years. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's that's great, Dad. I, I love that. And if we you know, compare it to earlier with, uh, with Gary's view and showing that he's looking through hydrogen alpha. So we're able to see all this red light because that's what the hydrogen alpha uh, band is actually putting. It's the red light, so that's what we're seeing here. So we're, It's not we're, false color. We're seeing this long before the pyramids were even built, before most of civilization even existed 7,000 years ago. Correct, yeah. Yeah, the very first cities in, in, in what's now India and what was then yeah. Mesopotamia, uh, Egypt would have just been starting to, to come online. Even like Cusco, Cusco in Peru being the longest yeah. occupied city in the, the Western Hemisphere, um, that's still only 5,000 years back. That's not yeah. old enough to match the light that we're seeing in this picture. Yeah. So. No, I, that's a great job, Ted. That's, that's awesome. Thanks. I'm I'm proud yes. of you. I'm, oh, thank you, I'm Scott. I'm proud of you, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hop over to Mark. What are we looking at, Mark? So I've got the, this is called the S cluster because it looks like an S. You are talking about the open clusters that kind of look like stuff. It's oh, yeah. a sideways S. Yeah, you can see some of it, yep. It's kind of in the lower, my yeah, lower Yeah, in, lo in the lower left side of the picture. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. No, and I've, I've got that NGC object up, or at least my telescope pointed at it, but I can't really tell if I'm getting it or not because apparently it's just a really dense planetary nebula. Right. So I don't know if I can't, if I don't have enough magnification to see anything or if it's light pollution or what, but let me bring it up. I'll show you guys what, what I have. I'm looking up for what that is, the, um, the NGC 7027. Um, it was discovered in 1878 using a 31-inch reflector from um, the Marseille Observatory, but it's one of the smallest planetary nebulas but also one of the most extensively studied. So, and and you're using an eight inch reflecting? Uh, yeah, right. an eight inch uh, Schmidt cast screen. So we might have a little bit different from what was how it was originally found to what you're able to dissolve there. <laughs> that gives so me some... it looks just like looks like a star field, but this one star in the middle is a little bit weirdly shaped. So yeah, you can see it. Yeah, that's likely right. it. I know when you're visually sweeping for planetaries, you look for a star that doesn't quite focus down. That's why they're called planetaries, is because they look visually like planets. That's their association. They're not actually... That has nothing to do with planets. Whatsoever. Yeah, it's when the early astronomers were picking out things like the Eskimo and the Ring Nebula, they, they, they kind of have... Their, matter of fact, there's one planetary that's called the Ghost of Jupiter. I think it's an Aquarius. I can't remember the designation, but... It's uh, it, it has about the same kind of angular diameter as Jupiter visually, so. No, no, I think I think you did get that, Mark. So, Frostbite, even though he said thanks for trying, worth the shot. He he did get it. Great job. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, they're. We scoop we scooped a pod. We did. <laughs> oh man. I'm sh I'm sure their image is going to be way better than mine. Well, I I think we need to put yours on. You know, like you got first upload. All right, we're going to hop on back over to Russell. We have about 10 minutes left, so we want to see how he's doing with the moon here. You having fun out there, Russell? Chat once. <laughs> Shake up and down for yes, side to side for no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm still loving you know, being able to see those, the, the sunset. 
and still watching the peaks uh, beyond. Oh the yeah, trip. yeah. That's Not always a, the Terminator is always where you get the most contrast, and it's always the most visually interesting part of the moon to look at. And it's right around first and last quarter usually. Is a, in, right. and with with last quarter you can see the moon in the. I saw it this morning, as a matter of fact, from Denver while I was waiting for the bus. You could see it in the daytime. So you could see it right up against the sky. So. A lot of people don't know you can see the moon in the daytime. Either. Which yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I think it's surprising. Funny, yeah, yeah you, it's a, we see it all the time during the yeah. day. And you can see I've seen Venus in the daytime too. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a little trickier, but it's uh, once you know exactly where to look for it, it it's uh, it's not too difficult. And that's easier from Florida, I found. Although yeah. it's kind of strange with all the humidity there. Sometimes before sunset, the air can be very dry. Because I mean, I used to live in the Orlando area and could pick yeah. up Venus before sunset um, fairly often there. Haven't been able to do it really from uh, from LA. It helps so. when the moon is near it too. Yeah, uh, yeah. As right. a guide, the, the moon is a good guide. To, I've seen Jupiter near the moon uh, just prior to sunset. I've seen Venus. Um, I, and if you have binoculars, sometimes like uh, the moon is, is going to pass an occult spica several more times this year. Uh, it is possible to pick out spica when it's near the moon with binoculars. I've done that before, so it's a little more difficult. But. Yeah, I actually aligned on Venus before sunset tonight to make sure that you know I, things were working here. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, much easier with the scope and the finder scope and all. It's like, oh, okay, it's right there, no problem. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and Vance just asked, what camera are you using, Thad? You said it was a Hyperstar, right? So well, it's, a, it's an ATIC 314L Plus color CCD, and yeah, attached to a Hyperstar, oh, Hyperstar? on a 9 and a quarter inch scope. Yep. Nice. And That's those are 45 second exposures I've been taking. 45 seconds, okay. Yep. Cool. Very good. All right, so I'm going to hop on over to Gary. This is... Uh more of that area with the North America. This is the way I took it with the uh, Pelican would be up here at the top. I if I do a rotate on it, now it looks a little more like the North American Nebula. Yeah. Mm -hmm. with Mexico down here. Florida's a little stuck. Florida. Yeah. You yeah. looks a little fuzzy down there, David. You yeah. got to bring it together. It's Florida's going to be underwater in a few days. I, yeah. Another, you know, five or ten feet of water, and you'll be gone anyway. So it matter. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the Gulf Coast after sea level rise. Yes. Right? Right. So. <laughs> I think you can even see the uh, Panama Canal right down about here. Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. A little, little far north, but that's close. Now you can, oh, look at this. You can see the BP oil spill right in here. <laughs> Jeez. I see it's just a bunch of sad pelicans. <laughs> of sad pelicans down there. I, I think I think Deneb's out of frame on this, or is it is that Deneb in the center right there? No, Deneb is is off. Just off to the side. Quite a ways from there. Yeah. Uh, Deneb is three about three widths. Okay. From from where I am, three of my so about four degrees. Cool. So no, that I, is North America. That is North America. And yeah, you know, I'll I'll try not to bug you too much about it, Gary. But the the work you have done that I have seen from you looks awesome. So I, it's just showing you how much I like it. And if you could show that out, or at least with me privately, that'd be great. Oh, this will this will all I'll get them all out there on the morning. Awesome, that would be great. All right, well, it's about that time. Um, does anybody else have any final images before we sign off? Let's see. I can get a color wild duck here and. Uh, can give me about uh, a minute. I will give you a minute, and from there I'm going to I've got the mark. dumbbell here. Nice. Oh, yeah, go for the dumbbell, oh, cool. definitely. Nice, it's nice. It's a little faint. And how long of an exposure did you, did you do on that, Mark? Uh, that was 30 seconds. Okay. Just trying to get it get it in quick before we uh, wrap up. No, absolutely. That's, that's fantastic. Talk, you know, yeah. just talking about planetary nebulae, that's... That's in Volpectula as well, not far from the Nova, as a matter of fact, in the same general area. And it's blue, like most planetary nebulous it's, blood. It's a decent one for star parties if you're under fairly decent dark skies. It doesn't have to be pristine dark skies. You can pick it up. Well, and Mark, are you running any filters at all? Uh, no, I don't have any filters in right now because okay. my light pollution filter that I have makes everything like a bluish green. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what th what that has, but I got to get one of those. So, 
Yeah, I've got, is it the Botter one? Um, Botter high contrast filter. It still does the bluish green. I've actually been subtracting out background color when I've been mm -hmm. posting these, so they're not quite fresh out of the camera, but there's there's a little bit of touch up to, uh, to, to kind of push that back a little bit. Eh. I don't care. That's Everything's fine. photoshopped yeah. at this point, right? So I'm photoshopped. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually an Oompa Loompa. So let's see. So let me see if I can grab this uh, M11 quick here before we wrap up, right? Very good. And so I'll finish up here with Russell and then Thad. So I'm going to hop on to the moon now that he's rolling it down on his belly. Are you rotating the camera over there, Russell? <laughs> it, it, it seems over like the, moon. the, the moon's spiraling out of control in the Canadian sky. It, it, it might be right at that kind of pitch over point where you're on the on the where it's transiting kind of too sometimes. Yeah, that's true. Yep, and yeah, I'm doing the pitch over. You're right. <laughs> you are right. Very cool. That is very cool. And yeah, so what we're looking at, everyone, is that you know this is the Earth moving, not mm -hmm. the Moon moving. So as we're spinning around on our axis, and Russell's doing a fantastic job manually holding and guiding, this, <laughs> yeah. holding it. Uh, stable, trying to keep it going the, on there. The hardest thing when you're hand guiding is every time you put your hands on the scope, it, it shakes the entire thing. Right. Yeah. So it's if you're if you're doing it with elect electronic controls, it's a little smoother. But if you're if you're just having to manually push it, the whole scope jitters until it settles back down. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, you're seeing the the speckles of craters there, right on the Terminator going on and. No, that's that's great, Russell. Thank you for joining in. I haven't, you know, I don't think we've had you in for a while, so it's, it's really glad to to have you back in and showing us the moon. Although we need to we need to get you some better bandwidth so we can hear you and talk to you every <laughs> once in a while. Get some commentary from you as well. So while we're waiting, for, oh, there we go. Sad. There we go. So there's M11. Wow. So here's the wild duck. Oh, awesome. With some color. Yep. Oh, wait, come zoom back in there. Yeah, so so again, blue here means hot, right? When you're looking at yeah. stars, blue it's like flu flames. So bluer flames are hotter, bluer stars are hotter. Anything that's kind of reddish or or so is uh, cooler, or it's a star that may have gone giant or red supergiant. So the thing there's a contrast here that happens, right? The core of a red giant or a red supergiant star is much hotter, but that extra energy has pushed the outer layers so far out that they've cooled off. Um, relatively. So though the core is much hotter, the outer layers are cooler and thus redder. Awesome. Thus redder. No, that yeah. looks great. I, I'm really impressed with what you're able to get out there. That's. Thanks. I might have to, to be more efficient with the, the work I get done during a week so I can come hang out with you and we can... That faster, that faster hyperstar ratio I think makes a big... I know guys in Tucson had setups like that too and that so, yeah, I mean, that's the only place that makes it. It's what Star Arizona. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, so this is 30 seconds, 30-second 30 30 exposure. Seconds. Wow, that's awesome. All right, well, it is that time, so we're going to wrap it up here so we can see everyone's faces as we sign <laughs> off. I'm going to head back over to David. Thank you, David, for, Yay. for jumping in with us. Go Maven. Go Maven. <laughs> Actually, yeah. So you just got back from a conference about the Maven mission. Yes, I, I was. I was at uh, University of Colorado out in Denver. They invited a bunch of us science writers out there to view all things Maven, and we got to see the the Kepler control room they had there too. That was nice. a kind of interest. And we got to hold a piece of Mars. That was worth the trip right there. Oh, absolutely. They had, they had a uh, a Mars meteorite, uh, a fragment, a small fragment. They let us hold. So it was, it was pretty interesting. Looking forward to the launch in November. Absolutely. Um, well. Where can uh, are you going to? I'm sure you're going to be writing about it. Uh, where where can you be found? Uh, Universe Today, uh, Canada.com, Listasaur, my own site. I master guys with the Z on Twitter, and um, yeah, that's that's my primary contributing sites right now. And the virtual star party. The virtual star party. Everyone along. In space hangout and all things Universe Today. That's right. All right. Thanks a lot, David. Gary, my friend. Thank I'll you. I'll exit with a little high energy stuff here. Yes, there you go. In your evil laboratory. Yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, cool. Cool Tesla coil. Master. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks. And Mark? Good night, everybody. Pleasure to see you all, as always. Yeah, great to have you back, Mark. Stop Good being a stranger. Well, when the weather 
cooperate, so I'm tr- I try not to be. Yeah, for sure. And Russell says bye, so thank you for bringing the moon, Russell. <laughs> From the moon. Appreciate it. From the moon, he's signing off. Sad. Thanks, sir. Sure, thanks. Thanks for giving me uh, my, my first run with the, the Hyperstar in the backyard here. Yeah, so thanks awesome. for not messing it, it up. Cool. No, you know, <laughs> yeah. great it job. was a yeah. success. It was very so, good. I'm so, really impressed. So now you will must perform and multitask from now on. From now on, yeah. From now on. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this week. Uh, I will be back next week hosting the Virtual Star Party. Um, we have the weekly Space Hangout on Friday, and I'll also be releasing a new Space Fan News with Tony Darnell for then. So that's all I'm really aware of for any Hangouts coming up this week, so we will see you next time. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody. everybody. Later. Good night.